Good evening. Welcome to welcome back to Philippians. Welcome to Core. It's our youth series for the week. I'm a little spastic because this is the third or fourth time I've recorded this without some issue. <sighs> okay. Um, again, though, welcome back to Philippians week five. What really matters? My goals for today's lesson is to help reinforce the perspective. Uh, that Paul brings of joy even in the midst of trials. I want to help you recognize what you can truly count as gain in your own life and for you to be able to forget what's behind you and grow closer towards Jesus. So I know it's been a long time since we've covered any part of this book. It's been almost four weeks. And I'm excited to pick it back up and finish it at the same time. Over the next four weeks, we're going to wrap up. Uh, the funny thing is that we actually stopped the series right at the halfway point. We covered Philippians 1 and 2 in the first four weeks, and this week and the next three, we're going to cover Philippians 3 and 4. Um, so I'm ready to dig in. Are you? I, Lord knows I've been. So let's dig into this. Now Paul, Paul is writing to the Philippians to encourage them by knowing that there is nothing that they can do to achieve salvation by their own works. Anyone who says so, Paul says, is evil. But to illustrate how much he believes this, he points out that if anyone had the right to boast about this, it's him. We see this in Philippians 3, 1 to 6. And now, my brothers and sisters, be filled with joy in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. I want you, I want to be sure that you are prepared. Be careful of the dogs, those men whose work does only harm. They want to cut on everyone who is not circumcised. But we are the ones who have true circumcision, we who worship God through his spirit. We don't trust in ourselves or anything we do. We can take pride only in Christ Jesus. Even if I am able to trust in myself, still I don't do it. If anyone else thinks they have a reason to trust in themselves, they should know that I have a greater reason for doing so. I was circumcised on the eighth day after my birth. I am from the people of Israel in the tribe of Benjamin. I am a true Jew, and so were my parents. The law was very important to me. That is why I became a Pharisee. I was so eager to defend my religion that I persecuted the church, and no one could follow, find fault with the way I obeyed the law of Moses. So, let's discuss. So Paul starts off this letter with, and now, or some translations use finally. Why would Paul lead off his letters with finally if he's just now hitting the halfway point? Well, it wasn't uncommon to write like this any more than it is for us to say, oh, one more thing four different times before we close a conversation. And now just means, oh, one more thing. And Paul says finally or and now again in... Uh, chapter 4. So who are the dogs that Paul was talking about in verse 2? Well, I promise to you, it wasn't any Pomeranians, Chihuahuas, lab, Golden Labs. It wasn't any of those. They were talking about the Judaizers, or Paul was. They were Jews who thought that they, the Old Testament needed to be honored in order to be a Christian. So this meant that they would force pot, the would-be followers of Christ to be circumcised and obey other Jewish customs in order to convert into Christianity. Paul calls these people the mutilators of the flesh as well. So who is Paul referring to when he says the ones who have the true circumcision? Circumcision. Well, Paul's talking about us Christians. We are the ones that have true circumcision with circumcised hearts who put no confidence in the flesh but rely on Jesus for our salvation. And what are some things that Paul says that are true of him that qualifies him for salvation according to the dog system? Well, I mean, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Jew. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew. He was a Pharisee. You know what? Let's just talk more about Paul's potential pride here. So again, he was born on the eighth day, or he was circumcised on the eighth day as any Jew would have been. He's from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin, so he's Jewish. He's a Hebrew of Hebrew and the poster child for Judaism. As for the law, he was a Pharisee, so he knows his stuff like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. 
for zeal before he was Paul. He was Saul that persecuted church and Christians for being a Jew, or as a Jew. And for legalistic righteousness, he was faultless. He kept the letter of the law perfectly. So, yeah, I'd say if anybody had the right to brag about their own personal religious accomplishments, it's Paul. And yet his tone changes dramatically in verse 7. And he mentions how all of this is meaningless. Verse 7 starts off as such. At one time, all these things were important to me. But because of Christ, I decided that they are worth nothing. Not only these things, but now I think that all things are worth nothing. With the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of Christ, I lost these things. And now I know that they are all worthless trash. All I want to know now is Christ. I want to belong to him. In Christ, I am right with God. But my being right does not come from following the law. It comes from God through faith. God uses my faith in Christ to make me right with him. So above all else, here's Paul's point. It doesn't matter how much time you spend each day in the Bible. It doesn't matter how, much, how many hours you spend a week at church. It doesn't matter how many mission trips you go on or how much you give to the church. People who take pride in religious accomplishments is just a modern-day Judaizer. And Paul and Jesus would stand in sharp judgment against such merit systems. Listen to where Paul goes with this. And listen for the voice of Jesus in your conscience urging you to change your value system. Let's discuss this a little bit more. What does Paul count as loss in verse 7? Well, he counts whatever was to his profit as loss. And in addition, what does he count as loss in verse 8? Well, he counts everything and all things as loss. So how does Paul describe his former way of life in verse 8? Well, he calls it, well, he calls it rubbish. Uh, different translations, the one we read calls it trash. We're going to talk more about this in a minute. So what makes us righteous according to verse 9? Well, righteousness as well as faith seems to be possessed by Christ, not us. In other words, it's Christ's righteousness that makes us righteous. He is reinforcing that our salvation is from God through Christ and has very little to do with us. So I want to give you the Greek lesson for today. Uh, the Greek word for rubbish is skubala. Uh, this just means human waste, so crap. Um, Philippi, like most of the Roman cities, would have had public bathrooms where people did their business indiscreetly, and this word was associated with those places. And that, though, is how worthless Paul thought of his accomplishments and possessions before knowing Christ. So let's wrap this up. Philippians 3, 10 to 16 says this. All I want to know is Christ and the power that raised him from death. I want to share in his sufferings and be like him even in his death. Then there is hope that I myself will somehow be raised from death. I don't mean I'm exactly where God wants me to be. I have not reached that goal, but I continue trying to reach it and make it mine. That's what Christ Jesus wants me to do. It's the reason he made me his. Brothers and sisters, I know that I still have a long way to go, but there's one thing I do. I forget what is in the past and try as hard as I can to reach the goal before me. I keep running hard toward the finish line to get the prize that is mine because God has called me through Christ Jesus to the life up there in heaven. All of us who have grown, spirit, grown to be spiritually mature should think this way too. And if there's, any, if there's any of this that you don't agree with, God will make it clear to you. We should continue following the truth that we already have. So again, let's discuss. What does verses 10 and 11 mean to you given Paul's circumstances? So remember, I believe Paul, um, during this letter, is in prison in Rome, I want to say. Um, so he's already in prison. He's trying to tell them to just reach the goal of, learn, of being like Christ. So in verse, 11, verse 10 and 11, it says, just know Christ. Know the power that he has. You know, sometimes we have to share in the sufferings and even be like him even in his death, all of this Paul is holding on to in hope that somehow that he and Jesus will meet again in heaven. And actually that's the answer to the next question is what is the ultimate goal and prize that Paul discusses? It's the ultimate, it's to be with Jesus. 
and he's awaiting that moment when that's so in heaven. So how does one press on as indicated by Paul? So in our translation doesn't necessarily state it, uh, state press on directly, uh, but the text does make it clear, the text does make it clear that knowing Christ is the only way to truly press on. So verse 16 mentions something. What does we already have mean in verse 16? Well, it means we have already obtained salvation, and with salvation we've decided, we decided to put Christ first. And as such, we should continue to do so each day, pressing forward towards Jesus. And the final question today is, what kind of things do you face from being, that keeps you from being closer to Jesus? What attitudes, possessions, external stressors hold you back? Um, and my example is this iPhone. Uh, my phone is a gateway to social media, so therefore my possession leads to the external stressor, which changes my attitude. I was one that social media was getting to me too much, um, and I needed to make a change. So right now on my phone, there's no social media on there unless you count YouTube. But that was keeping me back from Jesus because I would get in these attitudes of, you know, the world sucks. I just want to be left alone right now. So my reality stays the same. And that was definitely one of the biggest things that was holding me back. So let's make this real a little bit. We spend a lot of time checking and energy trying to do things, trying to do a lot of things. Perhaps we don't spend, perhaps we spend a lot of time checking things off our religious checklist. We are so involved in the church that we don't spend time with Jesus we are so busy telling people that they're sinners that we don't love anybody. So I want to do something that might make us a little uncomfortable, just, just a little bit, but it'll be worth it. So I want you to close your eyes. And for the next few minutes, we're going to take time to surrender to God in prayer. This time is between you and God. And I want you to ask God to reveal something that you need to give him. And if you're ready to give it up, if it's rubbish, trash, crap compared to Christ, raise your hands in the air. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds of silence to have this conversation, and then I'm just going to go right into the prayer. that keep us far from you. They are but trash in comparison to knowing you. Compared to you, nothing is significant. Take from us what we don't need and give to us your spirit, your strength, and yourself. Now what I want you to do is lower your hands and put them in a cupping position like you're trying to trap water from a faucet. We are going to have one minute of silence. And during that time, I want you to ask God to fill your life with the things that matter, love, faith, and the Spirit of Christ. And I'll be back, and we'll close with a unison prayer in a minute. Go. take hold 
that which Christ took hold for me. I press on toward, towards the goal to obtain the prize in heaven. I will take hold of it. Amen. And what I want you to do now is grip your hands together and take hold of the promises of God, not only figuratively, but in a very real way. Tonight you've been changed by the Spirit of God, and it can last. And that, my friends, wraps up our lesson for today. I want to give you a sneak preview after that powerful message. Next week we're going to have a message that's called Stand Firm. We're going to learn how we must stand firm and hold on till the day of resurrection with our Lord. But don't go anywhere yet. We need to cover today's announcement. Um, Friday, meme review, 6 p.m. I'm going to go through the, the subreddit r slash Christian memes, and we're just going to see what fun we have. So Friday at 6, Monday at 6, we have children's time. We're wrapping up our community series. We're going to learn how communities grow. Don't forget about our Facebook post that goes up at 10 a.m. every Monday to that has all the activities you need for the following video. And then I will see you right back here for week six of Philippians. And actually, I want to preview to our next series, uh, depending if we get to it um, immediately. Um, oh, excuse me. There is a project that might be coming up soon that, um, and that might take some extra time, so I might have to take a, a little bit of a break. Um, but we'll see. So, but my kids are going to grow because we're going to redo a series that we've already done, but I didn't do it all. And I want to go back there and take my time with it again. So we're going to do Proverbs Revisited. That'll start about halfway through August. Uh, I think it's like August 19th. August 19th, we'll start week one of Proverbs Revisited. So stay tuned for that as well. Like I said, there's another project that could be coming up soon. I don't have all the details yet, but I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to announce it until I have some more concrete details. But there we are. So as always, stay safe, stay sane, and I get to do this now. Stay blessed.